hot foxy valentine roy shows us a good time with the latest pulsar thermal scope i'm just going to give you a little squeeze like a bagpipe and we'll see if we can get you squeaking <laughs> Ferret's last stand. I joined Jaff for the final rabbiting session of the season. A wildlife trust goes feral and anglers fight back. News Ed Ben is in darkest Kent. Plus, if you become our 1,000th member, you get a unique handmade hunting knife. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's Valentine's Day and Roy has put an ad in the local rag. Middle-aged white male. Own hair? Well, a bit of it. Into artificial insemination. Good sense of humour. Seeks cameraman for a night of hot foxing. Say no more. Oh, David, I've always wanted to go out with you on Valentine's evening. And due to lockdown, we thought, what better can we do? <laughs> because we're not going to be going to a nice fancy restaurant and eating a wonderful dinner. So we're going to go out for a romantic evening and David is going to serenade some foxes. He did say that he is suffering from trapped wind tonight. <laughs> so I'm, I, what I'm going to do... Am I? <laughs> you're the one that's got it, mate. I'm just going to give you a little squeeze like a bagpipe <laughs> and we'll see if we can get you squeaking. Oh, sake, man. <laughs> get to the point. I am getting to the point. <laughs> it's, stop it. If you stop laughing, we can get this done and we can actually go and shoot something or try to. Now, anyway, so we shall be, we'll be heading out there. Um, all the foxes are calling up at the moment. Um, a lot of them uh, are, have already mated, but uh, there's obviously still a few vixens going around at the moment that are, are looking for boyfriends. And I've also got the brand new Pulsar Trail 2 on the rifle tonight, and that has got the built-in laser rangefinder. So I'm really looking forward to having a play with that. We used it for the first time the other evening and got to know it. Very similar um, to the, the first one, but we've got a few different uh, reticle choices that have been really, really helpful. So hopefully we shall have a run through with some of those reticles, show you what it can do, and hopefully account for a few, if David can stay quiet. So with snow still on the ground and a stiff wind, it will be interesting to see what responses we get. Roy is going to be using the usual distress calls, but as it's that time of year, he'll also use an electronic call. You can hear the foxes screaming over in the background. So we're going to set up and get the Fox Pro out already. Um, we're going to try a few mouth squeaks, we won't waste too long on that and then we'll flick over to a few of the calls on the Fox Pro um, which is, one of them is um, Vixen in Heat so we'll see if anything comes and plays with that so say so we'll set that up um, about 80 yards down there we've got a strong wind coming in and what we're going to do is we're going to stand against the truck here because this is obviously very white the light is incredibly good for the foxes to see any movement tonight so we're just going to use the, the, the truck as cover um, so it will hopefully hide any movement that we're making. Nothing moves and Roy thinks the calls just aren't punching through to the wood thanks to the wind. The second stand puts us closer to cover, but that's not where the fox comes from. Charlie is using Roy's Pulsar Accolade to spot, which is a huge help when the guy behind the rifle has a limited field of view through the thermal scope. One down, then another. What did we get then, Roy? So the first fox that came in to our right that made us and was making off over the bank there. That was a, a really, really large vixen. Um, and then we had the dog fox just down here. We've got an awful lot of sheep in here that are due to lamb. So it's not going to be long before the lambs start getting about. So we really do need to just take the edge off the fox population. So the, uh, we're, not, we're not going to be losing too many definite ones that needed to be taken out of the mix there. Roy is no stranger to pulsar thermal scopes and the Trail 2 is proving another capable bit of kit with some new tricks. I've absolutely loved the original one and this one is, um, is absolutely brilliant as well. So as I say, there's a few, a few little changes on it and a few uh, highlights which I really like. So just some of the new reticle setups are really nice. Um, images, absolutely fantastic, very nice, crisp and clear. 
I'm not one for reading manuals. I like getting out and playing with the kit um, and putting it through its paces. So again, very easy to use, very simple to set up, very easy to, to zero and, and away you go really. Battery life has been good on them. And again, I'll, I'll try and run through um, with the rangefinder on here because it's literally just a, a quick flick at the front on the front button and it brings up a little square, you press it again, and then it just gives you the exact range so you know how far away you are. And that's always been the hardest thing with using night vision and using thermal, is just trying to figure out your ranges if you don't know the fields that you're in. So if, you, you know, if, it's, uh, if you're unaware of your ranges from um, historical shooting, it just gives you that little bit of an edge, um, just so you know exactly where you are. And again, with the identification um, on some of the thermal that's coming out now, you are able to extend your shots. But again, you do have to be incredibly careful because you can, you know, even with the, the kit we've got now, you do still need to make sure that you've 100% identified exactly what it is. We've got something moving down there. I'm just going to zoom into it. I'll press record so you can see it. We'll just zoom in there. Let's see what that is. I'll just try and focus it a little bit. Okay, can't quite work that out, but we should be able to ping a range on it. So let's just see how far that is. So that's 315 meters down there. I think actually that is a rabbit at that range. So we'll just go through. So we're on eight times mag now, 16 times mag. Yeah, I think that's a rabbit. Back to two times mag. So we'll have a call here and see if we can stir anybody up. small is it? It's a fair size. Three's not a bad night for Valentine's anyway. So yeah, so uh, two's company, three's a crowd, and if we can get four, then I'll leave that to your imagination. I really wasn't going to go there. I really wasn't going to go there. It's been a bitterly cold Valentine's night with a lot of funny noises and bangs in the dark, but it's worth a second date. For more information about the Pulsar Thermal Range, go to thomasjacks.co.uk. Thank you, Roy, and what an evening to remember. Normally, of course, Valentine's weekend is disrupted by the British shooting show, so let's hope next year. Next, with his rose still clamped between his teeth, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Shooters and common sense have won in Northern Ireland. The police service of Northern Ireland recently announced that all gun parts, including magazines, had to be listed separately on firearm certificates at £30 a pop. Now PSNI Chief Superintendent Sam Donaldson recognises the lack of consultation, has paused the policy and apologised. The wildfire season has started early in Scotland this year. Antis on social media are blaming Muirburn and calling for bans. However, fires have so far started on unkeepered land, where controlled cold burn has not created the firebreaks. 
Firemen say several blazes on islands off the west coast which escaped the snowstorms from the east were caused by bone dry vegetation that only needs the tiniest ignition source and are spread by strong winds. Gamekeepers helped put out some of the fires. What is going on with mountain hares at RSPB Abernethy? That's the question the Angus Glens Moorlands group is asking Scottish MPs who are opposed to moorland management. A gamekeeper who spent two hours at the reserve at the weekend couldn't find any hares which were abundant at Abernethy under previous management. Meanwhile on grouse moors there are hares aplenty. AGMG provides this handy side-by-side -side comparison to show the difference. The group wants to know whether RSPB has an official hare count. Soft drink giant Coca-Cola has bottled out over shooting a fox. Antis on social media spread rumours a mass cull was planned at Coke's Sidcup plant in Kent and labelled the company barbaric. After threats of a boycott by a handful of people on Facebook, the company changed its mind, saying it would find an alternative way to get rid of the one fox it says it's been damaging its production plant. US clothing giant Patagonia confirms it is paying money to anti-hunting group Moreland Monitors. It's given Moreland Monitors a financial grant for an undisclosed amount plus access to the Patagonia ActionWorks platform, which will help the animal rights extremists raise money and reach a wider audience on social media. The cash payments to a group dedicated to end grouse shooting has provoked anger from hunting and shooting communities worldwide. The group claims to be non-violent, but persecutes gamekeepers and supports hunt saboteurs. Three of the UK's shooting magazines are to merge with other mags. Monthly title Sporting Rifle, which Charlie launched as editor, will become part of the weekly Shooting Times. The monthly Shooting Gazette is to be absorbed into the Field Monthly, and Clay Shooting will be a section in Sporting Gun. The magazines all belong to Future Publishing, which bought TI Media in 2020. A spokesperson for Future declined to comment. Future is yet to confirm when the magazines will close. Embattled Borth Wildlife Animal Kingdom looks like it will permanently close. Owners Dean and Tracy Tweedy failed to convince a judge at the Insolvency and Companies Court in London that measures they planned would raise the £120,000 needed to settle debts, some dating back to 2017. Both lions are thought to have gone to Port Lim Safari Park in Kent, where two lion cubs died this year. One froze to death and the other was squashed by adults just days after its birth, according to the Daily Mail. Port Lim, run by prominent anti-hunter Damien Aspinall, recently hired PM Boris Johnson's animal rights lobbying spin doctor fiancé Carrie Simons as its new head of communications. Thanks to Steve Kearney for that. A farmer is still under investigation by the Environment Agency. Two months after he undertook riverbank works, he says the Environment Agency ordered. John Price cleared undergrowth and bankside trees from the River Lug in Herefordshire in the autumn of 2020, drawing condemnation from both Natural England and the Environment Agency. Two months down the line, both the Environment Agency and Natural England are still investigating the case and considering prosecution. A study has found that feeding a cat meat will reduce the likelihood of it hunting wildlife. Millions of domestic cats eat billions of small animals and birds every year, threatening ecosystems in some places. Researchers at Exeter University say some cat foods contain plant proteins that leave cats short of micronutrients, prompting them to hunt. The study also says bells on collars makes no difference to the amount of wildlife killed. It may make some of the guns that won the West, but now US gun maker Colt is owned by an Eastern European competitor. Colt has supplied the US military and police forces with handguns since the mid 19th century. Men and women in the Wild West relied on Colt guns as settlers began building the country we know today. Czech firearms company CZ Group bought the 185 year old company for 220 million US dollars in cash and stock. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has passed the buck on his gun control problem. Trudeau made emotional promises to ban guns after mass shootings. Now he has announced Bill C-21, which will allow cities to ban residents from owning certain guns used for target shooting. One Field Sports Channel viewer points out that the Greater Vancouver area is made up of 21 different cities, which will each be allowed to make its own laws on gun ownership. So the impact will only be virtue signalling. And finally, is this the shotgun of the future? 
The Kalashnikov MP5 Ultima, launched recently, has a built-in computer and video camera that helps teach you to shoot. It's aimed at Generation Z customers who can't bear to be away from tech. We asked Bill Harriman from the Antiques Roadshow if this is an antique of the future. I can't really see that, um, unless we're talking thousands of years, Kalashnikovs will be antiques. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, we are pleased that our membership is growing nicely. Thank you. It's creeping close to the 1,000 member milestone. Our good friend Dean Smallwood of ADG Knives, you may have seen him manning our stand at the British Shooting Show last year, has made us a special one-off engraved knife to mark the occasion. Today, I am unboxing the uh, prize knife which is going to go to the thousandth member to sign up to the Field Sports Nation. And for the person, the lucky person, you will receive this deer hunter knife, and as you can see, with the thousandth member of the Field Sports Nation. It's a deer hunter Gralaking knife. Uh, it's made from 01 tool steel. It's three millimeters uh, wide. It has black pearl curonite scales with stainless steel pins and it's a little party piece. If you charge it up before you go out, these liners are luminous. And so I think we've all done it. Put a knife down at night, look around, can't find it. Hopefully this one will tell you where it is. And we made a film with Dean about how to choose a knife shape. Uh, which is on Field Tester, and there's a link to that in the description below. So who knows, as part of signing up, you may get a special extra goodie box. Now, here are some of our new members sporting their new beanies. Matt Coombe looks like he's going for the swimming hat version. Sporting artist Katie Hargreaves, who donated the prize for this week's Field Sports Nation competition. And three-year-old Alice, daughter of new member Josh Ward from Wiltshire. Next up, let's go ferreting. <laughs> This is not the first time the South Somerset ferreters have been to this field. came about eight years ago, and that hedge behind me, that's the best ever day we had. We had 64 in one day out of that hedge. Um, You're always optimistic at I know. the start of the day. Yeah. Is, that, is that a ferreting thing? Yeah, you've got to be optimistic. You know, there's no point coming out if you ain't going to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's our last day of the season as well, um, so hopefully we'll go out with a bang. Um, but yeah, eight years ago, 64 rabbits out of one hedge. We came down on Wednesday night, had a shine round. The numbers are back. We counted about 40, 50 rabbits in this field. I mean, might not get so many out of that hedge, but we've got other hedges to do, so, you know, yeah. Jaff has a top tip for nets. He has come up with a new style of net that works in these wide hedges. What I've done, I've made some, I call them hedge nets, for putting up in the right wide deal, because I've got loads of purse nets. Don't tend to use purse nets so much. So I cut the rings off of, the end of two nets and join them together just to make bigger, bigger nets. It's so just a double sized purse net basically and they're ideal for going in gaps in hedges and stuff you know. And do you string them up or do you put them over holes? Just string them up, yeah so any runs in the hedges they're, they're strung up, yeah they work well you know. So they're like a kind of hybrid gate net purse net? Though. Yeah and I just bodge them together because I'm no seamstress, I don't know how to make nets or tie nets together so it looks a bit of a bodge but they work you know. <laughs> yeah. Rabbit damage is evident in this field, and that's why the farmer called in Jaff and the team. The field is surrounded by houses, and from one of them comes a young ferreting enthusiast. Yeah, I watch their videos, very good videos, like, yeah. And you're getting a ferret as well yourself? Yeah, I am. Yeah. And, uh, and would you like to join this lot? I would, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll make sure your application goes in. Yeah. A lot of people want to know the best techniques for dispatching rabbits. Jaff shows how simple it is. My preferred method is to put your hand round its neck, so the back of the head is it on your hand, and just, just basically get your palm of your other hand and push straight over. And that breaks up that rabbit's neck instantly. And the other method 
grab it by the back legs. Two fingers behind the back of the neck. Stretch it and pull up at the same time. So basically, stretch, pull, break its neck. Instant death. It's been a great last day of the 2020-2021 season with 35 rabbits caught. Jaff is happy to hang up his nets on this one. Just so the viewers know, Charlie chose 24 on the sweepstake and now he's going home. I think what it is, he's cold. Charlie, you got cold today, haven't you? Nonsense. Yeah, so it's either a cold or he wants to win the sweepstake. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not here, you'll catch a lot more. That's true, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll carry on catch a few more, but what a great last day for the season, you know. So, uh, could wish for a uh, better last day. So You can find the South Somerset Ferreters on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks, Jaff. And after I left, they had the police turn up following a complaint about COVID distancing, which the police reckoned was probably more about someone local not liking ferreting. And so the police told Jaff that ferreting is fine. Now let's go to Kent for what's not fine. After 70 years looking after a popular fishing spot, anglers in Sevenoaks are angry that Kent Wildlife Trust has told them to leave. The trust says they have plans for a wilder Kent, including doubling the size of the car park and opening up sensitive areas that were off limits for decades. So can the trust be trusted to look after Sevenoaks Wildlife Reserve? The Bromley and District Angling Society has been fishing in these waters at Seven Oaks Wildlife Reserve for more than 70 years. Kent Wildlife Trust, which has managed the place since 2002, is trying to kick them out. What does the trust find so offensive about the anglers? I don't know. We provide free management. We provide over a thousand man hours a year of free labour, working on the trees and the banks. Um, we contribute a lot. Our people are here seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They're the only people looking after the site. Kent Wildlife Trust staff are here fleetingly. The Trust says evicting the anglers is part of plans for a wilder Kent. This includes upgrading the visitor centre to include a swankier cafe, improved toilet facilities, a car park for twice as many cars, room for four coaches and more toilets. They have plans, which I've seen, to employ somebody to maximise the income and one of the areas that they have to be involved in is applying for licences to hold weddings and glamping, not on every site, maybe not on this one, but they've only got three main visitor centres and this is the biggest one I suspect. So they'll be looking to have weddings on this site, on a nature reserve. It's irresponsible what they've done here, I think. It, 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 all, all, from my opinion, I, I just think they want to turn this area, this reserve into a cash cow. Charge you to park your car £3.50 a day on a weekend. Um, probably charge you £5 for a sandwich and a cup of tea in the cafe. Um, and I'm sure you'll probably have to walk through the gift shop to get to the cafe. They have published on their um, website the plans to put in number plate recognition, car parking charges on all their sites, including this one, by the 22nd of February. Now, depending on where the cameras are placed, it may or may not catch anglers' cars coming in and out. The anglers are not just concerned for their future fishing at the reserve, but the reserve itself, after the trust opened up a sensitive area in 2020 turning a truly wild section off limits to everyone into a nature trail. This seems the complete opposite of the Trust's Wilder Kent policy. This, this was always a place where nature could hide away, um, away from the madding crowds, and, and that's all changed. Now Kent Wildlife Trust have built this circular walk to draw in the public. Now you've got a huge increase in footfall in this very sensitive area and it's completely uh, ruined um, this part of the reserve. If there are species there or were there that were sensitive to, to people and interaction with people they won't be there now 
um, that's not rewilding. That's the opposite. And that, I, that's something I don't understand. Johnny has been coming to the reserve for about 20 years. To him, it's been somewhere to unwind on days off from working in London. To him, the thought of Kent Wildlife Trust banning angling is harrowing. This is a very special place to me and hundreds of other people um, who are anglers and conservationists and have a vested interest in making sure this site is protected um, from, from a point of view um, of not only managing the fish stocks, obviously, but everything, the entire ecosystem that supports it. Um, and uh, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's been a devastating blow to myself and hundreds of other people. The main gripe anglers have is the lack of management by the trust, which owes them a lot. They furloughed most of their staff through the lockdown when there were hundreds and hundreds of people here. There was nobody. Throughout the past few months, I've been down here virtually every day as a visitor, more often than an angler, and I've constantly been picking up litter. Um, I've constantly been um, enforcing the KWT's rules. And I haven't been the only one. Um, the anglers have, have, have been um, very active in maintaining access to the site. But it's not the only complaint, and it seems they're not the only ones complaining about the state of the reserve. There are one, two, three, four or five hides around the site, bird hides. Uh, one has collapsed completely. One got burnt by vandals. The others are in a poor state of repair. They don't seem to be doing anything to, uh, to improve them at all. Bird watchers have said that in recent years the number of birds has diminished. There are less and less birds here every year. There is a sewage pipe runs right down here through to the main sewer over there. There have been three leaks of sewage in recent years into the lake which killed fish. Every single occasion when sewage leaks happened. It was anglers that spotted it. It was club members who dealt with it, along with Thames Water, Kent Wildlife Trust, Natural England, no interest whatsoever. It was entirely left to the anglers. If we're not here and that happens again, I suspect there'll be a disaster. There used to be benches here for people to sit on, but they don't look after them. They break and collapse. Another example of the neglect in recent years. Although we look after the swims, and we certainly, with their permission, remove any fallen trees. That's something we've always done. As I said before, we have lots of specialist equipment for getting trees out of the lakes, which Kent Wildlife Trust don't possess. And we've in fact lent them the equipment in the past so that their tree surgeons can get things out of the lake. Speaking of falling trees, I spotted this while interviewing Mig. It's clearly being delayed by the branches of two other trees. I'm not an expert on trees, but I do know that if it does fall, it could easily kill a walker on the path directly below it. You can't really get much more wild than that. Kent Wildlife Trust refused to be interviewed for this video. Instead, it repeated the key contradiction it uses to justify its plans to revamp the park, that the high number of visitors put increased pressure on wildlife, and redevelopment would help nature flourish. It did not give a reason why anglers need to leave. This nature reserve should be kept as just that, a alternative peaceful venue for bird watchers, anglers and walkers alike. And um, the, the Wildlife Trust are obviously looking to increase the footfall here. Um, and I, I honestly think it's um, entirely unnecessary and angling is more than compatible with all the interests that people have in this place. Kent Wildlife Trust have the head lease on the site and we have a fishing license which was a 15 year license and there are three years left to run. They initially gave us two months notice to leave and stop fishing. The license actually says even if we breached any of the protocols of the license we would be given three months notice to leave. We have never breached any of the protocols on the license We've certainly never been notified of any problem. We've always stuck to all the rules and regulations. We fish within the Environment Agency and Natural England regulations for the site. So we see no reason why we should be asked to stop fishing. We have a contract. 
Thanks, Ben, for looking into that. Let's hope it goes the angler's way. Now from Kent to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. <laughs> This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Jake Swindles sends me a film of him and a friend Josh spearfishing off the west coast of Scotland. Their channel is called Souls Untapped. Graham from Lanx Vermin Control gets in touch to point me to his latest UK Grey Squirrel Pest Control Air Arms S510 controlling those numbers. Wyke's Meat and Game from Northamptonshire is ferreting the second part of the boundaries and manages five rabbits. He says digging out is no fun at minus five degrees centigrade. A big old Dave Carey shooting film next. These are the sports birds at Baggett's Park in Staffordshire. Tweeds and pheasants, usually on pheasants, is out after pigeons for a few hours, roost shooting with his 28 ball. Plenty of birds around producing some great shooting. The Pest Above the Rest channel is shooting crows and pigeons with new dad Adam following an invitation from the farmer. Kingston Gun Dogs brings out episode 3 of Widgeon's World, training his sprocker spaniel pup to be a gun dog. And finally, yet another lovely film, if you need any more, showing how big game hunting in Africa saves local wildlife. Location for this one is wonderful Tanzania. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you, click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week, and if you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's out 7 pm. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.